Hello, it's Zoe Leonard here, tutor for the Diagnostic Imaging Abdomen course. I thought I'd run you through a quick video about my approach for interpreting an abdominal radiograph. Uh, so what we're going to do is have a look at a diagnostic study. First things first, always make sure that you've got two radiographic projections to interpret. I like to use the ventrodorsal projection and uh, the right lateral projection. The first thing is make sure that your study is diagnostic and fit for interpretation. On the lateral projection, you need to ensure that you've collimated out to include all of the diaphragm cranially back to the greater trochanter. And the same applies for the VD projection. The next most important thing is to check that the lateral projection is appropriately lateral. Look at the transverse processes as they come out from the vertebral bodies. They should be superimposed over one another in a lateral study, as this one is. For the ventral dorsal projection, ensure that the animal is lying straight with the spine in a straight line and the spinous processes are superimposed within the vertebral bodies. Once you've um, assured that these are correct, you can go on and interpret the study and you probably will have needed to have sedated your animal to take this diagnostic study. My approach for interpreting the abdomen is to start at the front and move around the patient looking at all of the organs in a systematic approach. I like to look at every organ in terms of its size, its shape, its margins, its location and its radiographic capacity. So if we start cranially and interpret the liver, it's easy to see the liver on the lateral projection. But what you need to also do is, at the same time, ensure that you interpret the, lat, the liver on the ventrodorsal projection as well. The liver should have smooth, regular margins that might not pr uh, project beyond the costal arch in a normal uh, dog or cat. The gastric axis is a line bisecting the fundus up here down to the pylorus. That line should be perpendicular to the ribs or parallel to the spine. That's a normal gastric axis. When the liver gets enlarged, that axis is pushed caudally, and when it's small, it can be cranially uh, distent, displaced. After evaluating the liver, I look at the spleen, and we can see the tail of the spleen nicely on the lateral in the dog. It has smooth, regular triangular margins. Don't forget the head of the spleen, which lives up here, caudal to the stomach. On the VD projection, we can see the spleen running down the left abdominal wall, and it still has that uh, smooth strap-like shape with sharp margins, the head being closely attached to the stomach. In the cat, you tend to just see the spleen on the VD projection, and it shouldn't be visible in the normal cat on the lateral projection. The next organ I evaluate is the urinary bladder and the legs have to be pulled off the abdomen enough for you to see the bladder, remembering of course its variable size according to whether the animal's urinated or not. Here's the outline of the urinary bladder on the ventrodorsal projection. The radiographs that we're looking at are for a female dog, remember that in the male you'll have the os penis superimposed over this study. The prostate gland in males lives back here at the caudal aspect of the neck of the bladder, not present in this animal, which is a female. The next thing I evaluate is the retroperitoneal space, and it's vital that the radiograph is lateral in order to interpret this, and we can see the nice streaky fat and soft tissue opacities that make up a normal retroperitoneal space. It's harder to evaluate on the ventrodorsal projection. Then I look at the kidneys. The left kidney is easier to see on the VD projection because it's separated from the liver, particularly if the animal is of normal body condition and has a small amount of retroperitoneal fat. It's often really easy to see the kidneys in really fat cats because of that retroperitoneal fat. The right kidney up here is more difficult to see because cranially it abuts the liver, the caudal fossa of the liver. The kidneys are visible on the lateral projections and they're separated somewhat. So here is the more caudally located left kidney and here is the caudally, uh, more cranially located right kidney. Remember that there are different measurements 
for the uh, length of kidneys on radiographs and these change for dogs and cats but they're referenced to the vertebral body length of L2 which means you measure L2 against the le length of the kidney and you can check the notes when you come to this section of the course. So that's most of the organs interpreted. Uh, now we're going to evaluate the gastrointestinal tract. I leave that to last because it's definitely the hardest. The stomach is usually contained within the costal arch and will variably contain, contain gas or ingester. Ideally, patients should be fasted before abdominal radiography, but sometimes in emergency situations this isn't the case. The gastric axis, as we indicated earlier, as we discussed earlier, is actually more about hepatic size than stomach size. You can see rugal folds in the fundus of the stomach outlined here. The stomach turns into the duodenum which runs down the right lateral body wall and sometimes shows up with gas in it although we can't see it in this patient. The next thing I interpret is the colon and the colon runs from the pelvic canal the descending colon runs up the left body wall, the transverse colon runs transversely caudal to the stomach and then the ascending colon runs down the right body wall and you end up in a curly squiggle which is the cecum. On the lateral projection we can see the cecum here and it often looks sigmoidal or corkscrew shaped filled with gas and that's normal. The colon sometimes contains faeces or gas which we can see is a stippled pattern and ascending, transverse and descending tends to lie all in the middle of the abdomen. The colon on the ventridorsal projection has a shape like a question mark, but on the lateral it's a bit more variable. And after interpreting the colon, then I go to the small intestine, and I leave this to last because it's definitely one of the hardest parts of the abdomen. You cannot interpret small intestinal wall thickness on a radiograph. It looks like the wall might be thickened here because we can see gas in the lumen, but it could be completely an artifact due to fluid in that lumen as well. So all we can say is that there is gas in the lumen and we can't interpret the wall thickness. You need an ultrasound for that. Small intestine is a bit like the hippie of the abdomen. It tends to lie free flowing and it shouldn't, there shouldn't be any nasty sharp bends or curves. It's all gentle flowing and mostly it contains soft tissue opacity and gas. Finally, we've got the peritoneal cavity and the ability for you to see the peritoneal cavity depends on how much fat is in the abdomen. So this dog has a nice amount of fat, good body condition, so we can see quite nicely the edges of the small intestine and the other organs. This of course changes in an emaciated animal or when there is increased soft tissue opacity like fluid in the abdomen, then we lose the ability to make out all of these structures. So we've finished pretty much with the abdomen. Finally, because we've got all the information here, I run my eyes over the pelvic limbs, the pelvis, particularly important in cases of trauma, the spine on both projections, the ribs, and finally the edge of the thorax that we've got on the abdomen. And once I've looked at all of these structures, in order on both projections, then I know that my interpretation is complete.